So where does the high resolution EBSC technique fit within our strain measurement landscape? Well, if we take an axis of length scale on here, and we take our strain sensitivity over here, in an ideal world, we would like a big circle that maps across all length scales. Uh, probably we want something that has a very good strain sensitivity, so it's an ellipse that sits down here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that magic technique. Um, we can see that high-res EBSD is putting something that gives us something that spans a relatively reasonable length scale, depending on your probe size and how big you map. And it has a very good strain sensitivity, this 1 times 10 to the minus 4, um, which is now competing very well uh, with the sort of extra neutral measurements, but of course there are typically uh, many grain uh, techniques. This isn't the only game in town, and we do a lot of work comparing and contrasting X-ray diffraction with high-res EBSD, and you'll see that uh, in my uh, talk later in the schedule. So hopefully you're kind of interested in what the technique does. Let's just go back to a little bit of theory of what's present when we talk about strain. So first off, strain is a tensor. I would like to tell you that the strain is one single value of a scalar. The strain describes the change in object shape. The tensor means that there's a 1, 1 component, a 2, 2 component perhaps, a 3, 3 component, and then there's three bits of our shears that are kicking around. We can describe this tensor in terms of the elastic, i.e. that's the shifting the bonds away from their equilibrium position, and that's related to this, the, the stress within our system. The second point is that when you permanently change the object, you kick the dislocations through the material, and you can get a permanent shape change that is plastic. Now we have a diffraction-based technique, and that diffraction-based technique only enables us to access the elastic strains because we are just looking at specifically the change in bond length, or more particularly, we are looking at the change in bond angle. And so this elastic strain is the only bits that we get to access. We can get some idea about the plasticity in our system by thinking of these geometrically necessary dislocations. Um, but as I'm gonna convince you in the, the talk later uh, in the week, there are certain cases when I can get a significant amount of plastic strain and I have absolutely no GNDs in my system. So please be very careful about what you want to link your data towards, and you've got to be quite specific in which terms of your tensors you're evaluating. So let's just be a little more specific on how this works. We are thinking of strain as the deformation of an object from an initial configuration to a deformed configuration. Ideally, we like to map that change in configuration across a grid within our sample to see how that grain or object changes shape. So when we do this measurement, we're going to try and extract out effectively the change in uh, our crystal. And formally, if we think of taking any object and deforming it, we can describe this using Lee's multiplicative uh, decomposition theory, that we have an elastic portion and we have a plastic portion and EBSD can only access the elastic portion. We can use proxies and other bits of the story to get towards the plastic, but there is a lot of care and uh, effort to that bit. So when we do high EBSD and we access FE, effectively we can access the rotation. We can talk about how that diffraction pattern changes shape. That works perfectly. With EBSD, if we change the object's volume, we apply a hydrostatic strain, we cannot easily access that, because fundamentally that does not change the interplanar angles, it just changes the positions of the band, the widths of the band very slightly, uh, and we're not very good at measuring those band edges. But we can measure the deviatoric strains, that is effectively the change in any of these angles, by effectively tracking how this uh, zone axis changes shape as the object moves. So we can effectively think about the elastic strain in terms of the deviatoric elastic strain, and we can also have the other bit of our elastic deformation, which is our lattice rotation within that. And we can, of course, use the lattice rotation gradients to access the GMDs, and in some cases, that is a symptom of the plastic strain. So let's think about some examples. So this is my favorite example. Uh, perhaps because it's just so pretty. Uh, it also only took 40 minutes to capture on the SEM. 
So I'm capturing this at one by one bidding. I'm capturing a full diffraction pattern at each position in our map. And then I just take my data and process it offline. This took probably about half an hour to map. It's pretty fast to do the maths afterwards. So this is what I've got out of my conventional EBSD. This is my image quality. I've uh, carefully orientated my silicon to be pushing along my single crystal 001 axis. And I'm fracturing the objects as a consequence of inserting my bit of indent along the 110 type lattice plane. Now I get out of this, I will get two error metrics, something that describes how well the cross correlation works. It's akin to the reliability index uh, that Edgar was talking about. And I want this to be nice and red. How well do all my measurements fit together within each diffraction pattern pair? And I want this to be a small value. I want this to be blue. And so then I can just filter my data and says when the mean angular error is high or the peak height is low, I'm going to dump that data. My maps are going to get very big. And so having this quick screen is quite handy to work out what's poor quality to kick it off. So in my indent crater, life has got a bit of hard work for the silicon, and we don't get sensible diffraction. Now, I've got the full elastic strain, and this is a pictorial strain tensor. This is describing the strain with respect to the x-axis, with respect to the y-axis, and with respect to the z-axis, or out of the page of the board. I have my shear strain components that are up here, and I'm measuring my strains times 10 to the minus 4 within my map. So if I take my finger, and I push it into a piece of plasticine, and I release, the crystal will push back against my finger. I will get a compressive stress along the direction that I'm measuring. And lo and behold, my silicon pushes back against my crystal. As I look at the next component of the tensor, the, the crystal is pushing back in a different turn. The crystal was actually indented badly. Uh, the sample was very slightly misaligned. I was slightly slack when I did the indentation. And that's why the lobes are not quite symmetric. Um, hang on to some experiments, uh, but it still looks pretty good. <coughs> The shear strain components, that's if you want to do one, uh, if you want to do the rotation of the strain tensor, uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, I frankly can't be more certain in my head to check it, uh, but I'm very sure that this is correct. Now the outer plane strains, these are relatively small because fundamentally we're near the free surface, and the outer plane stress is effectively zero. So it's only because I have anisotropic Hooke's law that I have a little bit of strain that's present there, but it's frankly very close to zero. I have a lot more in the 3-3 three, three term. And I said earlier on that I can't measure the volumetric strain. Well, I've forced my system to have an outer plane stress condition, the sigma 3-3. Three, three, and then I've solved to say, how can I make that work? Uh, and we get that we necessarily have to have some outer plane strain present to make the maths behave itself. If I'm a strain, I will be an anti-symmetric distortion. Uh, sorry, a, a symmetric distortion. If I'm a rotation, I will be an uh, anti-symmetric distortion. And so that just is how the maths falls out. We take some very good diffraction patterns. Uh, this is titanium. This is our nice basal plane. We will extract a series of regions of interest associated with zone axes. The very nice thing with EBSD is that our zone axes are very well populated. Our diffraction pattern data is very dense. We will do a little bit of uh, image filtering to remove the high frequency spectral noise and low frequency long uh, range gradients in the Fourier domain. And then we will effectively compare our unstrained pattern to our strain pattern. Those very subtle variations we will extract out using a cross correlation function. Very simply, cross correlation is a mathematical tool that tells us how do we map my two right hands will pretend one on top of the other. And so I will measure the correlation, I will measure the correlation, I will measure the correlation at each position of displacement of effectively test versus reference. When they match well, I will get a peak in the cross correlation function. So here is my peak in the cross correlation function. Now the trick is that because I have 256 pixels by 256 pixels, I can actually measure the average correlation for that entire window. And so instead of having a single pixel as the value, I can model the shape of the peak, and I can therefore extract a best guess for that displacement that's required. And that enables me to access with sub-pixel precision 
the displacement of my test to reference dimensions. Why do I need that subpixel precision? Because basically my shift in my phosphor is related to components within my strain tensor and how far my sample is from my detector. If I have a thousand pixels and I have one pixel sensitivity, I am not going to get 10 to the minus four in the strain. A one pixel deviation will give you the 10 to the minus three. So it's a 10 to the pixel gives you this uh, of the order of one times 10 to the minus four. So there's a little bit of mass that relates the position of where I do my measurements to the shifts that are measured on the diffraction pattern with my cross correlation algorithms. And I extract out my components of my strain tensor, A, X, Y, etc. I can't extract the hydrostatic strain, so I cup all those bits together and I sort out all the geometry to make it work. Uh, and then I effectively can extract out the strain as the symmetric decomposition of the uh, A tensor and the rotation is the anti-symmetric within the infinitesimal framework. Or, or more particularly, I just go and hit the tab within Crosscourt to, to give me these terms, having done lots of maths uh, behind the scenes. So we see that we have, effectively, there are eight unknown terms for AIJ. There are eight bits of our strain and rotation that we don't know, and we have two measurements for each region of interest. So our problem is exactly determined if we have four regions of interest dispersed around our diffraction pattern. We, use F we splatter more, diffraction, uh, more regions of interest. We therefore obtain a best fit solution. We can test how good that best fit solution is. And that's how we get one of our error metrics. So effectively, we say, how well do the shifts fit a strain and rotation? And what you need in practice is a value that is less than your measurement of strain or rotation within it. So you can just compare, and that's how we choose the threshold for when we cut bad data out. You can lose some, you have some systematic errors that can come into this. Um, so just be aware that effectively the mean angle error just tells you how well does the displacement field that you measure on the diffraction pattern fit a strain or rotation. The next bit is we say how good is the cross correlation. Uh, we normalize because it's fast and cheap to do. We normalize to autocorrelation. We have zero where there's no correlation. Actually, if we have two patterns and there's no correlation, it tends to be that it's closer to 0.3. We calculate the geometric mean of all the cross-correlation functions, and that means that if you've got one bad region of interest, it will rapidly kick down your, your peak height. Uh, and that's quite useful for finding uh, issues within your data set. So typically we threshold something greater than 0.3. Um, in an ideal world, you'll be looking at better values. So we've got some error metrics. We've looked at how we can compare two diffraction patterns. The measurement technique measures the relative difference in strain state between the test and the reference pattern. Decisions that we can quite easily access in most systems is one times 10 to the minus four. Um, we can get better if we have very nice diffraction patterns. So in some germanium, we've got 2 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, in some cases. Uh, this could be better if we have better hardware. Uh, so lots of bits and pieces so far. Where are, sort of, where are things moving forward? Uh, one point is that we wanted to look at metallic systems and elastic strains in metallic systems. And it turns out that we had a little bit of a problem uh, in practice. And the key thing here is that we want to measure the elastic strain, which is very, very small in comparison to the rotation. Now, we all know that the diffraction pattern is a economic projection of effectively some diffraction spin. And it turns out as you rotate your crystal, your diffraction pattern moves, and it moves at a different rate depending on where that projection is happening. And that has an issue. So the key thing here is that effectively now when we have lots of rotation, we have that our diffraction pattern is not moving very much like our translations. We have some skew, we have some zoom, uh, and that can cause us a few issues. So what we tend to do is we do one pass of the cross-correlation routine, and we estimate a finite rotation matrix. We effectively use that rotation matrix to remap our test pattern back towards our reference. So we're going to remove all that rotation, or most of it, and from that remap condition, 
we're now going to do our translation measurements to pick out the elastic strain. Um, we can do this using standard image interpolation schemes. And what does this mean? It means that my cross-correlation peak, which I need to upsample with very high precision, goes from, uh, not looking great in here, um, it goes from something that looks uh, a bit murky to effectively something that looks slightly more gassy. So I can upsample slightly better within that sample. Um, what this really means is that as I have a significant amount of misorientation on X, if I don't do the remapping, I should have a flat line on some of these components, things just go wrong. When I use the remapping approach, effectively things work better, and so now I can recover strain in the presence of significant lattice rotation, up to a misorientation of plus or minus 10, uh, 10 degrees. So that's quite nice if I'm looking at a massively deformed grain uh, in a metallic system. Uh, and this is just to demonstrate that this really works. This is a, another piece of copper. We really do like our copper. Um, here we have a grain, and uh, you know, elastically, we shouldn't have very sharp gradients in the elastic field. This is our stress. If we do our remapping, we start to see that now our variations are much smoother within the grain, and they're only getting large when we have an issue related to equilibrium and compatibility of grain maps. So we start to truncate these erroneously large stresses and we now get a much more reasonable range of stresses that are present within our grain. So my final bit is thinking about what happens next. So we clearly have a diffraction pattern we're comparing with another diffraction pattern. Surely, and we'll see uh, some lovely stuff I think of Marx and others, can we not use these dynamical simulations as our reference patterns, or can we not use any simulations as our reference patterns? Well, what's the issue here? The issue is that we effectively have a floating strain. We do not necessarily know what that strain state is, but it just actually means in practice that we can shift or add or subtract an average strain state to each grain. I can extract that average strain state perhaps via X-ray diffraction or via a modeling technique, and we use that uh, quite a lot. Uh, and there's a nice demonstration by our Japanese colleagues to say actually, it doesn't hugely matter where you choose the reference point within your grain, the variation of strain states within that system is very well recovered. So that's quite useful. But what do we really want? We really want the absolute strain without all the modeling or without the extra methods. So we would love to use simulations. In a perfect world, it is a lovely, lovely idea. Unfortunately, life is somewhat less than perfect, and uh, my personal opinion is there is no evidence in the literature that this works. There are a significant number of claims, but uh, we have done a lot of work in 2011, it was published, that basically says there are too many imperfections for you to use a dynamical simulation <coughs> accurately. There are effectively three significant obstacles that you have to match. And I challenge members of the community, anytime they see these sort of talks, have people use an appropriate and realistic simulation. And I'll show you why that matters. Have the optimal distortions been carefully and appropriately measured and incorporated into either correcting the dis distortions within the experiment or to distort the simulation to match the experiment. And finally, how has the pattern sensor been measured to this unfortunate precision of one micron? Within each grain, we can measure the lattice rotation gradients to enable us to access the GMP contents, but this is just part of that plastic strain story. And there are lots and lots and lots of applications that are in the literature, and I think we have three data sets, hopefully, uh, within the demo session that we will explore. So thank you very much. Uh, I have some very biased references um, that will give you a bit more information about what we've uh, been doing and others have been doing. This is reasonably up to date with lots and lots and lots of high resolution USB papers, not just mine. Thank you very much for your attention.